Okay, it's week two, and all of our giggles are out, right? We're talking about sex, we're talking about relationships, we're talking about dating, purity. Now, you might just be coming across this channel going, wait, I, we haven't been talking about this. Subscribe now, because you're gonna wanna get this stuff. This is good, good content. But maybe you are more than likely with your e-group hanging around people that you love, you care for, or that you believe in. And what's about to happen is you're going to dive in to this message with Pastor Levi Lusco. And uh, this message is actually titled, The Problem with Pineapples. Ooh, are you ready? It's going to be really good. I think it's going to bring a lot of insight to your group, but make sure your leader's not doing all of the work, okay? You need to be participating, so make sure you take notes, lean in, and get ready. I believe this is really gonna be helpful for you guys. We love you. Enjoy this. Can we just acknowledge that? A lot of swipe, there's a lot of swiping going on. Um, they say we touch our phones 150 times a day on average. 150 times a day, which breaks down to once every six minutes. Or in the course of a normal day during this sermon, you would grab for your phone five to six times, which is a lot and disturbing if you think about it. Um, they say we're doing it so often, many of us are developing something called phantom vibration sensation, where you feel your phone buzz because you just got a text or you're sure you did. So you grab it. There's no text there. Mystery texter, where'd you go? Right? There's, there's no Instagram like, there's no YouTube play, there's no comment on anything. You just thought your phone, honesty in church, who's ever had that happen? That's scary, what we're doing to ourselves on the inside, right? Well, no, we don't really even know because the paint's dry. I mean, the internet's only been around as long as those of us who are 30 are old. So, like, we have no blooming clue what we're actually, we are lab rats in a grand global experiment. I mean, certainly it's not making us better at conversation. Right? Cash me outside. How about that? I mean, what does that even mean? I mean, it's like, what in the world are we talking about? Like, we're not getting better at driving. Uh, we're not becoming more creative and expressive. Our attention spans are not getting longer, I, I, I don't think. And, and how does this uh, butt into uh, re relationships? Well, in a lot of different ways. This is bringing sexuality into our lives. They say 36% of the internet is porn. Let that sink in. That's almost, that's, that's a lot. I was gonna say it's almost half, but my statistics and numbers, I would just, that's almost half. Get it? Um, they say one out of four Google searches is sexual in, 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 in nature. One out of four. And, uh, and of course, then there's, there's, there's dating apps. Now, it started with, you know, eHarmony and, and Match.com and, and people look more or less looking for someone to date, looking for someone, like, I wanna find someone to, that person, I wanna find the one. But now with dating apps, the purpose is shifting. It's not really even finding someone to date or marry. It's really just finding someone to be with just for the evening. The, 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 the advent of really the, the disposable relationship. Um, they say there's about 100 million users on these mobile dating apps now. Half of that on Tinder, the 800-pound gorilla in the game, the one that brought the swiping functionality to the experience. And, and so if, if you don't know, uh, or if you want to pretend like you have no clue, just, just look at me like, whoa, that's crazy. What Tinder, how do you even spell that? Pro tip, put your phone on silent. You get a Tinder notification while I'm preaching this sermon, you're going straight to hell. I am telling you right now, I'm warning, you've been warned, right? So uh, Tinder brings up a profile of somebody, a photo of somebody, and then a, a brief biography, 500 words, full of true statements about who you really are and your character and your integrity and your values and all of that. And, uh, and, and you read stuff, and, and then you swipe left if you're not interested. You swipe right if you are. And though maybe it's not how it was originally intended, or maybe it was, but how it's principally being used is by people looking to have sex with someone just for the evening with no intention of any relationship beyond that. And uh, it's, it's not uncommon in big cities uh, like, uh, like New York, LA, Charlotte, Kalispell, Montana, just the raging metropolises of the, of the land. By the way, pray for us. We just opened our first location in Oregon, uh, and we have one in Utah now. In January, we're opening in Wyoming. So if you know anybody in Jackson area, let them know. Uh, we're just having so much fun also in Montana. But, but it's not uncommon among, among the young people, you know, young graphic designer, attorney, whatever, career-minded, not wanting the drama of a relationship, but still having needs, you know what I'm saying? And, and, uh, and so to fire up the app, and in the words of one mobile uh, dater who I read about in Vanity Fair magazine, that, that all men are looking for today is to hit it and quit it. They fire up the app so they can hit it 
and quit it. I read one young man saying, I could go to a bar, I could go to a club, but I, I could just open the app up and I can know pretty sure in an hour or two, I could be having sex with someone and then back on my way like it never happened. This is what's happening. It's a huge shift. They say in human history, this is one of the two biggest movements in how we've approached mating and, and the ritual of romance. The other one was when we stopped being nomadic and settled down in farming communities. So like it's, there's a lot happening in our culture today. And my message in, in the book is it's not like, okay, let's quit swiping, right? That's like the church's overreaction. Like, okay, everybody, throw your phones in the pile. We're going to burn them, right? No, no, that's it. D- denim overalls. We're making our own butter. Come on, everyone to Montana. Let's go. <laughs> like, that's not the message. You know, is we, how, how could we reach a world that we abandon, right? How many of you are thankful that we're preaching the gospel on the internet right now? That, that we can, so we're not going to abandon the world. Is this, that's not the idea. Here, here's the mess. Here's, here's, a, here's a thought. Let's swipe right. Not left right, wrong right. There's a wrong way to live. There's a right way to live. How many of you know that if we look up, we can swipe right? That will be doing what Moses failed to do. Exodus 2.12. This is the kind of metaphor I use in the book where Moses, look at the text. It says, he looked this way, looked that way. Seeing no one, he did something he felt like doing. Killed the Egyptian, hid the body in the sand. The problem is when we just look to the right to culture, just look to the left to our friends, just look to the media, we got to look up. What does heaven think? What does God want us to do? How does God who made us want us to live our lives? How can we do justly, love mercy, walk humbly before. We got to look up so we can, we can swipe right. Now let's back up here. I'm talking about sex, bringing this all up. I, you should see some of your faces, by the way, like this is intense. Um, maybe you, you're new to church and you, you, you're, you're, you're a different church background than Elevation and you're not, quite frankly, used to pastors talking about real stuff. You're like, what the heck's happening here? Uh, and let me just apologize on behalf of many of us who as pastors spend most of our time answering questions that no one's asking. You know, you're, you're, you're struggling with debt, addicted to pornography. The pastor's up here trying to tell you about who the Antichrist is. You know, that, that's great for Gog and Magog, uh, be that as it may, but I got real issues here. And, uh, and, and, and so I think we need to speak to these things because how many of you know this book has a whole lot to say about the real issues that are facing our lives, devastating our homes, breaking up our marriages and messing with our children. So what, what, what do we need to know about God's plan for sex? Here we go. God wants you to have amazing sex. Uh, newsflash, I thought more of you would be excited about that. I, sex is really good. It feels great. I've had a lot of it. It's, we got five kids, guys. Uh, so if the day goes well, I might even have some more. It's awesome. And God's for that. He's not opposed to sex. It's, he's not ashamed of it. He, he invented it. Right? Like the devil loves to like act like it's his idea. And God's like, I got the patent for that on the wall in my office. What are you talking about? You see it in the in the book of Genesis, you know? Adam's there hanging out by himself. He's naming animals, just which by the way, was our first job. A creative assignment. To give a name, to speak something over something God had built. And uh, whatever Adam called it, that's what its name was. And you have that same life and death in the power of your tongue, what you choose to speak over someone. You can call them good for nothing, or you can call them loved by God. And what you speak over someone is what lingers over them. And uh, so there's a power to it. But Adam was lonely. And, and so God knew he needed to bring uh, Eve to Adam. So he caused a deep sleep to fall over him. Adam wakes up. There she is, Eve. Hey, when did you get here? Just a moment ago. Out of your rib, actually, right? <laughs> what? <laughs> and, uh, and Adam was excited. God the Father had brought the bride away, given her away at the first wedding. And then he, as the pastor, conducted the first wedding ceremony in human history. And, and Adam was excited. We, I could prove to you Adam was excited because he wrote a poem. And a guy has to be really excited to resort to poetry. Like, <laughs> it's actually in the Bible, the poem. It's, it's bone of my bone. Scandalous. Flesh of my flesh? If you translate that from the original Hebrew, it's if you had a twin, I would still choose you, girl. Right? You thought Bars and Battles was over. Oh, no. Adam, Adam's the original gangster rapper. I mean, it's like apple bottom jeans and the boots with a fur. It's what he said about Eve right then and there, back then in the OT, right? And God wasn't offended. He wasn't like, Adam, right? I mean, he brought the guy a naked wife. I think he knew what was going to happen next. Just, just saying. And... Um, So so listen, God is not against you having sex. The problem isn't you having a sex drive. The problem is when you let sex drive. It's when you do whatever you feel. It's you give into your every impulse. 
My, my thesis is that if sex is God-given, it should be God-governed. He gives it to us. He should, we should look to him to tell us how to get the most out of it, right? So, so what did God say about how to use sex? Well, he said in Genesis 2.24, therefore a man shall leave his father and mother, be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. And that's how I intend for you to use this gift of sex that's pleasurable but also powerful. If you leave it in the marriage bed, you'll get the most out of it. But if you take it out of the arena in which I intended for you to use it, you're going to hurt yourself. Sex is not just pleasurable, it's also powerful. Ironically, once God tells us how to use what he invented and gave to us as a gift, that's where we cop an attitude. <laughs> Whatever. Doesn't want me to have any fun. Like, but when do you use that logic anywhere else? Go to Home Depot, buy a chainsaw, see all the manuals? Like, Whatever. They don't want me to have any fun. No, you just intuitively know. They don't want you to chop your freaking arm off, right? Like, we assume the best positive intent on Home Depot, but get all huffy with God who made us, as though he doesn't know anything that we don't know. Y'all, I'm 35 years old. God doesn't even have a birthday. I figure there's a few things he knows that I don't know. And so rather than arrogantly puffing up our chests and stiffening our neck and saying, my will be done, I think we ought to humbly bow our knee and say, thy will be done. That's a better way to live your life. 